Welcome to the Introduction to Type Classes lesson. This is an introduction to the concept and use of type classes from the consumer's point of view. Meaning that, as we are developing in Haskell, there are type classes and we want to understand and use them. In future lessons, after learning about how to create types, we'll look at it from the point of view of the type class and instance creator. That's why we start by talking about the awesomeness of type classes. Then we'll take a quick look at what are type classes and the bulk of the lesson will be going through some common type classes you'll see quite often. At the end, we will explain how the compiler infers the use of type classes and how to use multiple constraints. So, why are type classes so awesome? So far, we learned that when defining a function, we choose that it could be used either with a specific type like this, takes an int, returns an int, or with a polymorphic type like this. It takes a tuple of two types and returns a value of the first type. The first one, provides a lot of safety because by making sure that your function only takes int types, no matter the value it takes, you can do math with it. But the downside is that you're constrained to use the function with only that type. If you need it for double or float, for example, you have to redefine it again with a different name, like SQR double and SQR float, something like that. And in the second case, the polymorphic types provides a lot of flexibility because you can use the values of any type as input, but you lose all the safety that comes with using types. In this case, it doesn't matter. We don't need that safety, but in some cases we do. So we have something like this. Types provide a lot of safety and a bit of flexibility and polymorphic values provide a lot of flexibility and almost nothing of safety. Type classes are what you get when you're a stubborn programming language developer and you want the flexibility of having polymorphic types and the safety of using types all at the same time. At the end of the day, what type classes do is to allow to use restricted polymorphic values. Values that can be of different types, but not all of them, just an authorized subset. This is called ad hoc polymorphism or overloading, but you don't need to remember that right now. We'll take a closer look in a future lesson. Now that we know why type classes are awesome, Let's see what they actually are. If you meet people that belong to the advanced drawing club, you know that they can draw. Why? Because it's one of the requirements to enter the club. Type classes are like clubs that types can belong to if they have particular behaviors. Behavior in this context means function. So, a type class specifies a bunch of functions and each type that belongs to the type class has its own definitions or implementations of those functions. So, from the point of view of the developer that consumes pre-existing types and type classes, if you see that a type is an instance of a type class, you know that it implements and supports the functions of that type class. For example, the Boolean type. To see the type classes to which the bool type belongs, you can use the info command in DHCI and pass the bool type. In that case, you will get this. We'll learn about type and data in the next lesson. So if we ignore the first two lines of code, we see a bunch of lines that say instance. 
instance of EQ ball, instance of Earth of ball, etc. Those lines informs us that the bull type is an instance of the EQ type class and the OR type class and the enorm type class, etc. etc. So bull implements the functions of all those type classes. And naturally, now we want to know what behaviors those type classes define. So let's find out. Now we're going to go through the most common type classes. And I'm going to tell you what they represent and their main behaviors. But you don't have to memorize anything about this. After the creating type classes lesson, you'll be able to swiftly check everything I'll say in this class. Also, don't worry about the details just yet. We'll spend this and two more lessons on the type system. Use this lesson to start developing the idea of a type class and to get familiar with the most common built-in ones, which are usually the only ones you will need. We start with the EQ or EQ type class. The EQ type class, it's all about equality. The types that are instances of the EQ type class can say if two values of its type are equal or not by using the equal equals and not equals function. And because the bool type is an instance of EQ, we know that we can use those two functions to compare values of that type, like this. And if we check the signatures of the equals equals and not equals functions, we'll see a few new things. The fat arrow symbol is the class constraint symbol. It indicates that a polymorphic type is constrained to be an instance of a type class. The code to the right of the fat arrow is the same type signature we used so far, and the code to the left indicates the class constraints. In this case, the code to the right of the fat arrow indicates that these functions the two of them, because both have the same signature, take two polymorphic values and return a Boolean. Same as always. And the code to the left of the fat arrow indicates that the type A that is used twice at the right of the fat arrow has to be an instance of the EQ type class. So we are constraining or limiting the types that you can pass to these two functions from all the types to only those that are instances of the EQ type class. And it doesn't stop there. For example, imagine you create this function. You take two values and you compare them. If they are equal, you return the first, else you return the second. You don't do math or manipulate strings, but you do check if the values are equal. So you want to make sure that this function only accepts values that can be checked for equality. That's what the AQ type class constraint is for, to block you from using types with values that can't be compared. And because the equals equals function has the EQA constraint and func uses this function inside, the compiler is smart enough to infer that our function's type signature also has that constraint. So func takes two values of the same type and returns a value, and the type of all those values are an instance of the EQ type class. And now comes the moment of truth. To how many types can I apply these functions? We know that we can apply it to bool because bool is an instance of EQ. But what else? Which are the other instances? Well, if you use the info command for EQ, you'll see a huge list 
all the types that are instances of this type class. As you can see, all the types we encountered so far, int, float, double, char, bool, etc., because there are more, are instances of this type class, except for functions. That's why we can check if two values of type char, float, etc. are equal or not. And that's why we can apply the function func we just defined to any of them. And if you happen to pass a value that isn't an instance of EQ, like a function, for example, in this case, we define two functions that take a single parameter, each one. The first function adds one, the second adds two and removes one. So, are these functions equal? The expression is different, so are they different? But they return always the same value, so are they equal? We don't know. And the compiler doesn't either. Because no function is an instance of the EQ class. So if you try to run this code, you will get this error. And like this error says, the type function that goes integer to integer is not an instance for the EQ type class. And we need it to be because we are using the equals equals function. So the compiler is protecting us from using a type that is not an instance of the EQ type class. That's really cool, but you can't do much with types that belong only to the EQ type class. You can only tell if two values are equal or not. That's it. Luckily, the EQ type class is not the only club in town. We also have the ORT type class. The OR type class is all about ordering. The types that are instances of the OR type class can order their values and say which value is biggest. And for that, the OR type class has all these functions. We already used the inequality operators in previous lessons. They take two values of the same type that are instance of the OR type class and return a boolean, like this. And now we can see that the numeric types and the char type are also instances of the OR type class. And how are the values ordered? It depends of the type. With numbers, it follows the mathematical order. For example, four comes before five and after three. With characters, it follows the Unicode order. The Unicode specification has a table with an ordering and the chart type uses that ordering. And other types have other rankings. As we said, each type that belongs to a type class has its own implementations, meaning definitions, of those functions. We will learn more about it when creating our own instances. But with the ability to order things around, we can do more than just inequality. We also have the min and max function. The min function takes two values of a type that is an instance of ord and returns the minimum of the two. For example, if we ask the minimum of 12 and 19, we get 12. And the max function, of course, takes two values of the same type that is an instance of ORTH and returns the maximum of the two. For example, the same case, it returns 19. We also have the compare function. The compare function takes two values of a type that is an instance of ORTH and returns a value of type ORDERING, indicating the order of the values. In the same way that bool has only two values, true and false, the ordering type has only three values. We get lesser than with LT 
in this case, because four is lesser than nine, we also get greater than if the value is the first value is greater than the second value. And we also have the EQ value when the two values are equal. Again, so far, all the types we learn are instances of this class type, except for functions. Now, you might say, if I can check the EQ with the all type class, why do I need the EQ type class to begin with? Well, sometimes a type has to first be an instance of a type class to be allowed to become an instance of another. Like you have to belong to the doodling club to be allowed to apply to the drawing club. That's the case with EQ and order. To order the values of a type, for starters, you have to be able to tell if they are equal or not. This tells us that if we have a type that is an instance of the or type class, it also supports all the EQ behavior. In these cases, we say that EQ is a superclass of or, or conversely, or is a subclass of EQ. Again, you don't need to memorize all this. Initially, you will be able to quickly check it, and with a little bit more of time, you'll know all the behaviors and subclasses by heart. Let's keep going. Something similar occurs with numeric type classes. Numeric types are one of the most used types in any programming language. But not all numeric types can do the same things. Types that are instances of the num type class can behave like numbers, but not like a specific subset of numbers. The num type class defines behaviors that all numbers should have. For example, types that are instances of this type class can be, among other things, added, subtract, or multiply. For example, 5 minus 1, 8.9 plus 0 0.1, and we get an error when subtracting two characters. That's because char is not an instance of the num type class. Now we're talking. Imagine I want to create a function that does some math, like this. I don't want to choose a type like int and only allowed int values. Float, double, and integer types could work perfectly fine. But if there were no constraints, I could pass any type. What's the result of a plus b, or true plus false? It doesn't make any sense, because only types that are instances of the num type class can use plus, and because float, double, int, and integer are all instances of the num type class, we can constrain our function like this. We take the value x of polymorphic type A that is constrained to be an instance of the num type class, and we return a value of the same type. But remember that if you are not sure of the type signature, ask the compiler. It knows that to use plus, you have to be an instance of num. So it infers the type signature of add one automatically, providing flexibility and protecting us at the same time. This is cool, but sometimes we need something more specific. For example, the integral type class. The num type class includes all the numbers, but the integral type class can only the integral, meaning the whole numbers, such as 4, but not 4.3. Integral is a more exclusive club than num. Of all the types we saw so far, only int and integer belong to it. This type class defines many behaviors. One of the most well known integral functions is div. It takes two values of a type that is an instance of the integral type class and divides them, returning only the whole part of the division. For example, 3 div 5 gives you 0 and 5 div 2 gives you 2. 
And on the flip side, we have the fractional type class. The fractional type class is all about fractional numbers. The types that are instances of the fractional type class can represent and modify fractional values. By far, the most used function of the fractional type class is the almighty division. Unlike div, we can be more precise about our values because we are using fractional numbers. And only float and double are instances of this type class. For example, we can divide 10 over 5, that will give you the same result as the div function for integral numbers. But we can also do 5 over 2, that will give us a more precise 2.5, and 10 over 3, that will give us an even more precise 3.33333, etc. Notice that we never had to specify the type of the numeric values in any of the examples so far. That's because, for example, the number 3 can be a value of type int, integer, float, or double, and by applying certain functions like the division, the compiler can figure out that we meant the value 3 that belongs to one of the types that are instances of the fractional type. That's why if we check the type of this expression, we get that this is an expression of type A, when A is an instance of the fractional type class. That's it about numbers for now. Let's see the show type class. The show type class is used to convert values to readable strings. It has three different behaviors, but the one you're going to see over and over is the show function. The show function takes a polymorphic value that is an instance of the show type class and returns a string representation of the value. For example, if we show the value 3 of type int, we get a string with the character 3 in it. If we show the value true, we get a string with the text true. This is really useful for debugging and printing logs. Now, the counterpart is the read type class. The read type class provides the opposite behavior of the show type class. The most often used behavior is the read function. It takes a string and returns a value of the type we ask for, if possible. For example, if we read the string 3, we get back the value 3, the numeric value 3, and we divide it by 2 to get 1.5. If we read the string true, we'll get true back and compare it to false using the OR operator. True or false give us true. And if we read a list of numbers and we specify that the result has a type of list of integers, the read function will provide us the result of a list of integers. Keep in mind that if the string doesn't contain a valid value or the read function doesn't know the type that it needs to be returned, it will throw an exception, like this. In this case, if we just read the string 3, the function read doesn't know which of all the numeric types you're trying to get, so you get an exception. Same happens if you try to read a value that is non-existent inside the type you're asking for. We need a bool value, but this turu is not a value of type bool, so you get an exception. Okay, that's good enough for type classes for now. Now let's take a look at how the compiler infers types. So let's figure out the signature of this function. The f2c function could have a few different signatures. For example, it could have the type float to float. But while doing type inference, the compiler assumes nothing and constrains the function's type as little as possible, giving you the most general constraint. Let's do it step by step. 
In this case, the function takes a value and returns a value. So the most general signature will be A to A. But the value it takes must be a numeric type. We are applying several mathematical functions to it. But which type? It could be a type that is an instance of the num type class because the minus and the multiplication functions are behaviors of the num type class. Or it could be a type that is an instance of the fractional type class because the division is a behavior of the fractional type class. In this case, all numeric types are part of the num type class but only float and double are part of the fractional type class. So to make sure this function always works, it has to take the more restricted type class, meaning the fractional type class. And that's how the compiler infers the type of the expression. Notice that the type could have been even more specific, like float to float or double to double, but that will be assuming you need a more constrained type without any evidence. At the end of the day, the most general valid type wins. Okay, so until now, we'll be restricting if the type is an instance of a particular type class. And we know there can be more specialized type classes. Fractional, for example, is a more specialized type class than num. But what if we need a type with a more particular set of abilities? In that case, we can use multiple constraints. Sometimes you need different constraints for different type variables, or the same type variable with multiple constraints. And this can be easily expressed in Haskell. As an example of multiple constraints for the same type variable, take this function. This function takes a number and checks if it's equal to three, then if it is, it returns the value x plus one, else it returns the same number. Basically, this function returns the same value you're given, but it skips the three. The x, can be of any type that is an instance of the EQ type class because of equals equals. And num because of the plus. We are using x with the plus function and x with the equals equals function. And because we're comparing the input with the value three that belongs to the num type class, x also has to be an instance of the num type class. So, we need x to be both an instance of the eq type class and the num type class. To specify multiple constraints for the same type variable, we have to surround them by parentheses and add a comma between them, like if they were a tuple. In this case, we are getting the type variable p as an input and as a result, and this type variable is constrained to be both an instance of the EQ type class and the num type class. And of course, we could add more constraints if needed. Now, what about constraints for multiple type variables? Let's create a function that takes two values and returns one if the first value is greater than the second and zero otherwise. In this case, x and y have to be an instance of orth because we are using the greater than function and return a value that is a number, either one or zero, but that is an, a specified type. So the more general signature will just constrain them to be a type that is an instance of the num type class. Putting this together, the type signature will be this one. We get as an input, two values that are an instance of the OR type class, and as an output, a value that is an instance of the NUM type class. So as you can see, constraining types with type classes is pretty flexible. Now let's practice just a bit. What about this function? If you want, you can pause the video and try to figure out 
the type by yourself. This function, we compare x and y with the greater than function. So they have to be an instance of the or type class. And the return value is divided using the division, that is a behavior of the type class, in one of the if else paths. So z has to be an instance of fractional. Remember that we always return the same type, so both paths of the if then else have to return values of the same type. So this function has the type a to a, where a is an instance of the or type class and takes the third value that it takes is a polymorphic value that is an instance of fractional and returns a type that is also an instance of the fractional type class. And finally, our last example is a modification of mystery one where we add one to x before comparing it to y. If you want, try to pause the video and figure out the type by yourself. The type is the same as before, but now x and y also have to be an instance of the num type class to be able to use x. So the function mix mystery2 has the same type class, but now the polymorphic variable a is also an instance of the num type class. As you can see, we can apply as many constraints as needed. Of course, in the day to day, the compiler can infer them for you most of the time. But you'll still have to be aware of what's going on to correctly interpret and understand them. Also, writing a functions type before defining it is a good practice and a great way to ease up the process of defining it later. That's it for today. Make sure to complete your homework and I will see you in the next one.